Okay, hello everybody and welcome to another rendition of our Thursday night um, weekly programs. Every Thursday night we have a new program and most of the time a different speaker, which is uh, definitely a lot of variety, a lot of uh, fun there. Uh, my name is Abby Huffman. I am Director of Programs here for the Adams County Historical Society. And I would like to, first of all, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I definitely know you're gonna enjoy tonight's speaker. For those who don't know, the Historical Society is more than just a building full of books and artifacts. Um, we do house about a million different out of artifacts, but we're currently working on a new building, which will not only include all the proper storage for said artifacts, but it'll give you a chance as uh, folks from the community to be able to come in and do your research. There's a nice building we're being planned with a big museum uh, and an event center. So hopefully soon we'll be able to have some face-to-face -face programs as well. And this is definitely more than just um, more than just stories and books and artifacts. This is all about your history and how the community and all the stories come together, um, which makes me uh, think about the program for this evening. Tonight we have Nancy Goodmanstead, who is the founder and director for the Shriver House Museum. Uh, for those of you that don't know, I spent a lot of time downtown with Miss Nancy, working as one of her docents, and recently um, starting some work here at the Historical Society as well. It is really cool to see the history here um, with all of the artifacts and the documents and then seeing it come to life with kind of what Miss Nancy's doing. So without further ado, I would like to turn it over to Miss Nancy. She does have her camera off today so you can focus on her super awesome pictures. So go ahead, Nancy. Thank you, Abby. I couldn't be happier to be here. And I'd like to tell the story of a little slice of Adams County that probably a lot of people don't know. Um, my husband and I moved to Gettysburg back in 1984. We were young, very young children. And we actually opened up the very first bed and breakfast in Gettysburg. It was called the Old Appleford Inn. Uh, the address is 218 Carlisle Street, right off the edge, at the edge of the campus of the college. And it's in a magnificent home. It was 6,500 square feet, 10 original bedrooms, five fireplaces. It was absolutely beautiful. But one of the things we realized as soon as we opened is that every morning, we'd have all these folks from all over the place sitting around the breakfast table. And they would talk about General Lee and the wheat field and the peat torture. But the one thing that struck my husband, Dell and I is that the only civilian that anyone ever talked about was Jenny Wade. And of course, Jenny has an amazing story and it's a wonderful house to go and visit. But we thought, you know, that can't be the only story. Uh, everything was focused on soldiers, but there were 2,400 people who called Gettysburg home back in 1860s, and they had to have more stories than just Jenny's. So we decided <clears throat> that one day we would fix up a house to look like that time and tell the stories of people and what happened to them here in town. But we sort of put it in the back of our brain, and after about four years, we decided to sell the old Appleford Inn. We loved it, but it did sit on the campus of the college, and we were surrounded by three fraternity houses, and that was some evenings quite difficult. So, But we loved Gettysburg. We wanted to stay in town here, so we started searching for something else to do. And for a long, long time, we just went back and forth and back and forth. And the one idea that we kept coming back to was that there was not, at that time, not much entertainment for folks in the evening. So we thought, uh, what would people like to do? We decided to open up a miniature golf course. So we went searching for a place to do it. And of course, we love a challenge. And here was this great big piece of property down on Baltimore Street. A Baltimore Pike, I guess it would be, and right across the street from Powers Hill, if you know the battlefield. And we found this piece of property, and it turns out it used to be Krause's Junkyard. And this is the way it looked back in the 1960s and 70s. It is not the way it looked when we bought the property, but it was, everybody talked about Krause's Junkyard when we very first opened up. And uh, this little house right here became our ice cream parlor. All of this stuff was gone. However, during the building of the, the golf course, it was kind of funny because, oh my gosh, you couldn't turn a, job, a shovel over without finding nuts and bolts and rear view mirrors and just all kinds of things from the cars uh, after they were hauled away that were still left in the ground. And uh, so after a little bit of work, this is the way it looked. It was absolutely gorgeous. We had two 18-hole courses, and it was really nice because it was our plan was 
it was a wonderful thing that local families could do, something different. Uh, obviously, some people in town get a little tired of the history, so this was not history oriented, but it was also fun for the tourists. You can do the battlefield for a long, long time, but eventually you need a little bit of a break. So this was a really fun thing to do. And we think it was quite beautiful. And we were quite proud of it. We had it open for um, 29 years and eventually we did sell it to the National the Civil War Trust. Eventually the property will be restored uh, to its 1860s appearance and then turned over to the National Park. In the meantime, it's sitting empty. It's looking pretty sad, but it had its day. We weren't up very long at the Miniature Golf Course and uh, we actually got kind of bored. We sort of like starting things. So we were trying to figure out what else could we do here in town. And we kind of revisited that idea of telling the stories of the families here in town. We've realized that everybody in town knows about what happened on the battlefield, but do they know what happened to the families in their homes in town? So once again, we were on the search. We were looking for a house and we wanted to be in the main part of town. And this is the lovely house that we bought. Some of you who have lived in Gettysburg for a long, long time may recognize the house. It's located at 309 Baltimore Street. It was, uh, it was an absolute mess. We could afford it because of the condition that it was in. Well, it turns out that the house was not for sale, but the man who owned it had been sitting vacant for almost 30 years. When we found out who owned it, and it turns out it was the gentleman that helped us to build the miniature golf course to shape all the hills and things. My husband and I went to see him and said, you know, we would be interested in purchasing the house. I was very, very excited, told him all the plans that we had. And he listened to us and he just said, nope, he didn't want to part with it. So I would say, no nope, exaggeration, maybe 70 times over the next year, he got cakes and pies and cases of beer and baseball caps and all kinds of things. And finally, one day he said, oh, my Lord, if I say yes, will you leave me alone? And we said, sure, you'll still be our friend, but we won't come and nag you anymore. And at that, we said, can we see inside the house? Because we had never seen on the inside of the house. And uh, the very first time we walked in, oh, I'm sorry, we picked this piece of, we wanted to be on Baltimore Street because this is really, I won't say the heart of the battlefield in downtown Gettysburg, but it definitely was a big part of the battlefield. And uh, from telling the Shriver story today, after telling it for quite a long time, we really realized that so many people come to town. They think the battlefield is Pickett's Charge and Devil's Den and the Wheat Field, and sure enough it is. But the one thing so many people don't realize is that the battlefield was actually every square inch of the town. I'm told that the National Park today owns about 6,000 acres, but I was also told that really the battlefield was about 26,000 acres. So that means every square inch of the area was actually battlefield. And we wanted to be right in the heart of that. So finally, we got asked if we could go inside and Leonard said, yes, we could go and check it out. And when we walked in the house for the first time, this is what we found. It truly had been empty for almost 30 years. The house was all just a disaster. Oh, I'm not really good at computer stuff here. <laughs> so this was the center hall. You can see here a lot of newspapers and things. It was probably about, well, almost 30 years of junk mail that had come through the front door. We found a newspaper from a uh, Philadelphia Bulletin from 1969. It still had the rubber band around it. Of course, it all fell apart when we picked it up. But this is the condition. This was the uh, center hall. Uh, this was the parlor. This is the main area of the parlor. There was a fireplace in there. We were told when we first got into the house, when we finally took over, that our architect thought that this bump out right here was actually a fireplace. He wasn't sure, but he told us to drill a hole through the front of it, open it up, and if it was hollow, we had a fireplace. If it was solid, we just had a brick wall, which he said, we'll repair that later because we're gonna making, be making a million holes inside the wall. Well, it turns out it was open, and he said, if it's open, to go under, pull up a floorboard down here and look underneath the uh, floorboard, and he said, almost always you'll find little things that fell behind the mantle and things over the years. And sure enough, we found a, found a pair of eyeglasses. Oh my God, you would have thought we won the lottery. We were so excited. Well, it was a fireplace and we did restore it. This looks much, much prettier than it did today. So the really bad parts were upstairs in the attic. 
it was a real mess. This right here, it turns out that the uh, there was a very serious leak in the roof for many, many, many years. And that caused an awful lot of water damage. But I say every day, the Shriver house, it's a good thing and a bad thing about the house. The bad thing, having a serious leak in the roof was not such a good thing. Uh, but the good thing is it, we found so many things by having to repair those walls inside the house. We were told at one point there were about 30 cats living inside the house. Another good thing and a bad thing, every square inch of flooring in the house was covered with linoleum and they only tacked it down at the edges, they never glued it down. So all during the restoration process, we left all that linoleum on the floors, and at the very end of the process, when we picked them up, we were absolutely thrilled at the condition of the floors, they're absolutely gorgeous. So this is the chimney upstairs, that was in really sad condition. You can see here these little gray areas, that's cement or whatever, um, these are bullet holes from the battle, and I'll explain more about that as we go along. Well, that green ugly house, that's the way my husband saw the house, but this is what I saw. I just knew that this was a jewel in the middle of town that nobody even realized. This is what the house looks like today, and of course, it's absolutely beautiful. Well, the plan on doing all this restoration work was to tell the stories of families from all over town, what they went through during the fighting. In the middle of doing all that restoration work, we started to uncover the story of the family who built this house and who lived in the house during the battle. Turns out the National Park didn't even know this story. The house was built in 1860, just a few months before the Civil War started. And this is the family that bought it, George and Hetty Shriver. They had two little girls, Sadie and Molly. George Shriver was born on a farm south of town off of Greenmount Road. And Hetty was born in a house, well, she was actually born in Littlestown, but grew up in a house on Tony Town Road. It's the Jacob Weikert Farm. You may be familiar with that. It's a beautiful house. It's still there. George's house is still there as well. And both of the houses are just absolutely gorgeous. When they moved into the house, they had two little girls, Sadie Shriver was seven years old. Molly was just five when they moved in. When they bought the house, the plan was to build a beautiful new house for the family, but also a business for George, Shriver's Saloon and Ten Pin Alley. In the cellar here, this is where George built a saloon or a bar. In the backyard, he built a two-lane, fully enclosed Ten Pin Bowling Alley. This is not George's bowling alley, but it's representative of what a house, a bowling alley did look like at that time period. George's bowling alley was 14 by 65 feet. It was actually two lanes wide, where this is just one lane wide. So this is pretty unique in Gettysburg at the time. There was nothing like this around. So George, I always say, I think he was way ahead of his time. This is the way the house turned out. It is absolutely gorgeous today. This is the parlor in the Shriver's home. There's the fireplace that we, where we found the eyeglasses and things inside there. And it's just beautiful. Uh, this is Hetty's kitchen. And I, that too was a disaster when we bought the house. Uh, these shelvings were not here. And again, this, everything was meant to be. When we took down uh, the wallpaper that was here, that was old, like 1950s wallpaper, you could see the outline of these shelves. And there was a shadow from where the shelves had been. It gave us the idea of the width of the wood, the dimensions of the wood. And there were actually little bits of green paint behind on the wall there and we were able to match it. And I think of all the paint matchings we ever did, this was really the best. It looks just like the paint that was there when Hetty was there. This room would have been wallpapered because we found a nice sample of wallpaper from the room, uh, but we haven't gotten around to doing that yet because I always say it, this house, it is a restoration in progress. All the rooms, when we did this to open it up to, as a museum, we didn't look, want it to look like a very sterile museum. We really wanted it to look like a family lived in this house. So this is Sadie and Molly's bedroom. There's one shore, shoe on the floor. Lord only knows what Sadie did with the other one. Uh, the bed is not made because that's the way two little girls would leave it. But in here, you'll see their toys, their games. They're doing their homework lessons on the table here. So we really wanted to look alive. And I think that we did a pretty good job on that, if I say so myself. One of the most exciting things to do in the house, uh, during the restoration, we found out that uh, during the battle, 
Hetty Shriver uh, was absolutely petrified when they started setting up cannons in, on Baltimore Street right in front of her home. So she, she decided she would take Sadie and Molly somewhere safer back out to the farm where she grew up. While her house was sitting empty, it turns out it was taken by, over by Confederate sharpshooters. They went up into the attic. They punched these two holes through the brick wall to shoot through. Well, during the restoration, those holes, they had been all sealed up, but it was real obvious that something funny was going on with those holes. I, of course, was convinced that they were cannonball holes, but, but it was even better than that. When the, the, we restored the house, we happened to pick up one of the floorboards right underneath this hole, and lo and behold, we found six Civil War bullets dropped by these Confederate soldiers a long time ago. Three of those bullets, they're still live ammunition. That means they have the gunpowder still packed into them, uh, and which after all these years is just a very, very rare find. We um, found some other neat things underneath the floorboards. We found some Civil War medical supplies. And after the fighting was over, there were more than 23,000 of the most seriously wounded soldiers left behind after the fighting. And there were only 400 buildings in town and it had been raining cats and dogs. So we are very sure that this house was used to treat the wounded. We found these Civil War medical supplies. They were still hidden underneath the attic floorboards upstairs. These are the bullets we found. These are the three that are still live ammunition. One of my favorite finds, though, is we found a little girl's shoe. It was tucked in the ceiling above George and Hetty's bedroom, but we actually found it from reaching down in the attic up to, when we picked up one of the floorboards here. It turns out there was a custom back at the time when the Shrivers built their home that when a young family would build a new home, you would take a shoe from one family member and tuck it inside the walls of the house that was supposed to bring the family good luck. So we do believe that what this little shoe belonged to Sadie or Molly or maybe both with hand-me-downs. And uh, I do, don't know whether it brought, brought them good luck. You have to come and hear the Shriver story to figure that one out. Underneath this hole right here, a few years after we were here, we had, if I can change the screen, come on, why won't it work? Oh, Abby, I'm stuck. Can you right click? Just print next. There you go. Because we know that there were, we have an eyewitness that there were at least two soldiers killed upstairs in the attic, we were always anxious to be able to see if we could do a CSI testing, a luminol testing. And lo and behold, out of the blue, uh, this policeman here, this detective contacted us and said he was trying to test a new product. It was called Blue Star. And he said it was supposed to be better than luminol. And he wanted to know if he could test it because he also wanted to find out if blood that was that old could still be detected. So he came down and he made, mixed up his little chemical and sprayed it on the floor. And oh my word, these pictures, anything in blue is blood, but they do not do it justice. There was, I don't know, 20 times as much blood. It just, it just all did not get picked up in the photograph. We talked about the two openings there, and we know that one of the soldiers was killed in front of it, but there's also a window upstairs in the attic. And we got to talking about it, and we we're thinking, you know, if they could get shot through one of these little portholes here, or loopholes, they probably wouldn't want to stand in front of that big opening, the window opening up there. So we decided, he said, let's spray the whole wall. So he did, and there were hundreds of splashes around the two loophole openings from pinpoints to the size of a quarter. It was absolutely incredible. But around the window, there was not a drop. So again, that makes so much sense. And I'm not sure who was more excited that night, me or the, this detective here, because he said it reacted faster, it lasted much, much longer, and it was much brighter than luminol. So he went away a very, very happy camper and of course left us a very happy camper as well. So after telling the story for, of the Shrivers for so long and the fact that the house was taken over by Confederate soldiers, in part of her story, we would tell people how when Hetty came home from her parents' farm after the fighting was over, she would have found her house just a wreck. And we told that to people for many years. And then finally it dawned on us to tell people the house is wrecked is one thing, but to see the house wrecked is something completely different. So now when you take a tour, you start out in the parlor, life is wonderful, the house is gorgeous. When you get up to the attic, you find out that the house was taken over by Confederate sharp soldiers. 
And then you come back downstairs into the Shriver's parlor and this is what you walk into. The whole room, the, the sitting room and the kitchen, they are completely devastated. Broken furniture, there's pools of blood on the floor, half eaten food, lots of empty liquor bottles all over the place. And it's just, it's such an, when people walk in the room, I mean, they just, it takes their breath away. Because as I say, to see it is one thing, but to, to hear it is one thing, but to see it is completely something else. I'm very happy to say that, you know, we get a lot of tourists here in Gettysburg. Many, many, many school groups come from all over the country. And we are thrilled to say that we do thousands and thousands of school children every year. They come from places all over the East Coast and Florida, Utah, uh, even Hawaii and Alaska, we've had school students. And it's kind of interesting because after going on a two or three hour battlefield tour, sometimes the kids get off the bus like, oh my word, this is gonna be another boring story. And the great thing is we get them inside, start to tell them the story and you could hear a pin drop because we don't teach history. We teach history through the back door. We don't talk about generals. We don't talk about dates. We don't talk about battlefield names. We simply tell them a story of a young family and how their lives were changed completely by, why, by what happened here. So we are very happy and thrilled to meet with all these school students from all over the country. We do two very special events at the Shriver House each year. Uh, because the house was taken over by Confederates, we do a reenactment. We always do it around the 4th of July, which of course is the anniversary of the battle. And when you take a tour that day, it is lots of fun, but it's also lots of history. When you get up into the attic, instead of a tour guide telling you the story of what happened up there, you get to watch the soldiers shooting their rifles out of the attic window. And boy, you are guaranteed to see a soldier die on every tour because we know they love to die. So it's a fun day, but it's also a learning day as well. On that day, Shriver Saloon, it is the only day of the year that the saloon is open for business because you can belly up to the bar and grab a root beer. Because the house was used for wounded, we do also represent that side of the story. In the cellar kitchen, we do have an area set up to look like the house was being used to treat the wounded. We have some young girls who were supposed to be uh, helping out with um, bandages and that kind of thing. So it really is a very, very fun day. This is the first reenactment that we ever did. This is the 14th Tennessee Company B. And they were the soldiers that were shooting in the attic. They were running all around the house as well. And uh, we had this picture taken by Rob Gibson, who was a wonderful photographer here in town. He used period um, cameras, which was really neat. The same type of cameras that Matthew Brady used during the Civil War. So we lined the fellas all up out front and took their picture and we just love this picture because it just looks so real. Funny thing about it though, this house here on the left, it was not here during the battle. So we made sure that would be in the, the photograph so that if years from now, somebody found this photo, would be able to prove that it was not a real photo from the time period. I don't think they had a Schreiber house sign back then, but my favorite part, this fella right here, he's standing in front of the parking meters because we wanted it to look real and we had to disguise it. So that was the way we did it. But it's just such a great photograph. The other special event we do at the Shriver House is a candlelight Christmas tour every year during the holidays. We call that program Five Christmases at the Shriver House. The Shriver family moved in just before Christmas in 1860. So we have the whole first floor set up like they're having a great big open house party to show off their beautiful new home to their friends and family. We have a Christmas tree. We have a fire in the fireplace, lots of gifts. We have food and liquor and all the kinds of things that you would have to entertain your, your friends and family. So on the first floor, we talk about what it was like in 1860. Life was great. But by the second Christmas, George was off to fight in the war. So on each floor of the house, as we move along, we talk about how each of the five Christmases that the family spent in the house were so completely different. And it's really an interesting way to look at the, the property. It's just so beautiful. I am very proud to say that the year that we restored the house in 1996, we did win a Pennsylvania Historic Preservation Award uh, because the house was just so beautifully re restored. Because of that too, we have been a filming site many, many, many different times. These are just a few examples. This one here was called Lincoln at Gettysburg. It was on PBS and it showed how Abraham Lincoln was the very first president that was 
able to communicate with his troops really live through telegraph. So there's been so many different stories. It breaks my heart that the story has never been about the Schreier family, but maybe someday somebody will come back and tell their story. So this house was restored in 1996. We still call this a restoration in progress. We did find wallpaper from Hetty's parlor or kitchen, but we also found wallpaper from the parlor and these are samples of that. And it is our dream that one of these days we might be able to get that uh, restored, re reproduced and then put back into those true rooms just to make it look more and more like it did when the Schreiber family was living in here. We had an artist come for a tour one day, and she just fell in love with the story. Her name is Heidi Preecy, and she is an incredible artist. She asked if she could paint a painting around the Schreiber House story, and of course, we were thrilled. Heidi actually made this little dress this little girl is wearing by hand, stitched every stitch by hand, because when she does her work, she wants to do everything as, as authentically as possible. So this is little Emma. And we got a great picture of her in the backyard. And this is the painting that Heidi did. This is avail still available online in different places. So I think it's really just one of my favorite, favorite paintings. So this is the Schreiber house, the way it looked when it was originally built. There were no houses on either side. The house on the corner here was the home of James and Margaret Pierce. There today, the house that we use as a museum shop sits in here. It was not here, of course, during the battle. That was Mr. Pierce's side yard. That house here was built in the 1870s. Today, when you come to the Shriver's home, there are two houses in this space right here. But during the battle, this was all the Shriver's side yard. They had a great big garden and an orchard over there. So if you come for a tour today, and you'll walk down the little alleyway that's created by this house being here, you'll still see a lot of bullet holes on the side of the house, just evidence of what happened here in 1863. So this is one more slice of Gettysburg that I hope you will come and visit someday. And if you don't, I'm just hoping that you get to appreciate what, how many wonderful stories there are to be told here in Gettysburg. Abby, thank you again so much. Absolutely. Thank you for presenting. That was a very good overview of Shriver. Um, I do have a couple questions for you if you have some time. Sure thing. Um, I want to ask a question. I know I get it over at Shriver House a lot as a docent. Um, can you tell our viewers why, why the Shrivers? Are they more important than everybody else? Are they, um, wh why do we focus on their story today? I love that question because I said in the beginning that uh, we were going to tell the stories of all different families around town. The Shrivers are absolutely no more important than anyone else here in town, but we decided after discovering such an incredible story, we decided if you're going to stand on the Shrivers floorboards, you really ought to hear the Shrivers story. We do reference other folks when we take people on tours through the house because there are so many incredible stories in town that people don't get to hear. And I often think, had this house been sold back in 1996 to a normal couple, not crazies like us, and they put in a regular kitchen and TV and computers and things like that, this story would have been missed forever. And I often wonder how many other houses in town has that happened to. So I'm happy to tell the story of just this one family. That's great. And can you um, tell our viewers about um, Sadie and Molly? How old would they have been during the battle? Like, how can we relate this to young children as well? When they moved into the house, Sadie and Molly were three and five years old. Uh, by the time the Civil War, the battle came along, they were seven and five years old. When you walk through the house today, we try to bring them in a lot of, when we're doing tours with younger children, because there isn't much in town where the families can relate to the battle, but this is a great space to do it. When you get up to Sadie and Molly's bedroom, um, again, I wanted to, to look real and it's a great place for us to show children what did a room look like for a little girl back in those days? There was a chamber pot under the bed. There are toys from that time period. We even have Neko wafers on the desk where Sadie is doing her homework lessons because Neko's, it turns out, they've been around since 1847, long before the Shriver's home was even built. So we really try to bring the children's aspect into this, especially when we have children on the tour. Yeah, I, I find that so fascinating that the Shriver story and what you guys have really discovered over the years, it's not just about 
um, this general. It's not even just about this person in town, but it's about this family. Everybody can relate. The enlisted soldier, the young mom at home who had very little options, and then the little children as well. Um, it's such a great story. And I, I really appreciate coming from um, the historical society here. Um, I appreciate you taking the time to actually look at the house as that slice of Adams County and wanting to restore back that piece of history. Because really, if you wouldn't have restored, we, we'd have lost that, that story altogether, right? No, you're right. And also, at the end of our telling the story on every tour, we always tell people how we know that this really is a sad story. It is not a happy story at all. But we always say that we do this because we really want people to understand that the battle here, and as we're recording this, there is that awful battle going on in Ukraine. And it teaches us that battles, the things that we're watching on TV about that right now, it isn't just a story about soldiers and generals. It is also a story about family. So we're glad that the Shriver family has their story told. That's wonderful. Well, Nancy, thank you so much for sharing your story with us, sharing the background story, and then um, the story you're telling at Shriver House today. Um, we really appreciate you coming on and um, I love hearing your stories. Like, I just love hearing you tell them. Um, not that I'm biased because I also work for you, but um, <laughs> I just want to thank you for your insight. And thank you to everyone who joined in tonight. Thank you to those who uh, might have donated to our project. Um, if you didn't already know, there's a red heart button at the bottom. You can um, press that and help us to continue with our preservation efforts. And I hope that y'all will have a wonderful rest of your week. We will see you next Thursday for another program. Uh, Nancy, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for tell, talk, let, letting me talk about the Shriver House. And I hope if, when people visit that they might have a chance to come and see this little bit of history here. Absolutely. Thanks, Abby.